I recently drove for two days to go on a chair making course with some blacksmith mates. We were privileged to spend seven days at Glen Rundell's incredible workshop at Kyneton. Not only are we going to learn heaps from an expert chair maker, but we'll also be taking home our Windsor rocking chairs. Pull it back out like that. You won't pull it back out in the angle. This is the awesome chair that we'll be making. It's a comeback rocker. And as soon as we got there, we got straight into it. The first thing we did was to bend the armrests. The wood was split from this black wood log, which Glenn prepared for us earlier. There's a lot of work to get the chair done in a week. So a couple of things are prepped by Glenn to get things moving. Yep, a little bit more. We all bent our own pieces and they all went well with no issues, but apparently even with quality split wood, you can still often get some failures. And stop. Got it? Cool, nice job. Thank you. Later today, these will go in the hot box to dry out along with the back crest and the spindles, which are also made from the same wet green wood. We had a quick break and started on the spindles. And what I want to do is, you know, as evenly as I can is start to dial that in and get that nice straight taper. Okay. And I'm going with the, against the grain. So I'm just sort of being a little bit more cautious. See that tear area? That's what I was sort of expecting. Now it's our turn, so we each grabbed a shave horse, which none of us had used before, and started shaving the tapers. The spindles have a swell so far down and they taper down from that in both directions, leaving one end short. We're shaping them square now to keep them consistent, but eventually they'll be shaped round and all done with hand tools. Yeah, that's only because I'm not taking the care that Matt would have and I'm not an artisan, so... No pressure. No there are four of us doing the course. Daryl is sitting next to me here, and some of you would have seen Matt before from when he built the gate at my place. Also, there's Simo, who's disappeared for the moment. After lunch, we cut and bent the back crest, then we got back to the spindles. Yeah, that just running all day or no? You turned that off and then... Oh, yeah, it turned it off, yep. Now we'll get back to the spindles and we'll turn them into octagons. Yeah, and the beauty of that shave was just being able to unclamp and reclamp, you know, in less than a second. You can't do that. On a boss. What you can do is rather than having your, and this is a fingers and, and thumb um, situation, it's not trying to ride it like a motorbike. His fingers and thumbs there like that. If you're finding that springy or it's pushing down and vibrating on you, you can change the position, even up those facets with the spoke shape. At this stage, we're not trying to get down to the final dimension. We'll do that after they've dried. We're removing most of the material now as the green wood is easier and better to work with. I didn't get my short ones done, which are for the armrest, but they can go in the drying cupboard and I'll finish those in a couple of days when they're dry. It's the end of day one and we'll put all those greenwood pieces we've been working on into the drying cupboard. Then the next day we'll start on the seats and they're from seasoned wood that's already dry. We've paired up to drill the holes for the legs and to drill accurately with a cordless drill we'll use lasers. This can also be done with mirrors and we'll use that method later on. We're following sight lines that we've marked out onto the seats. Then with a the laser 90 degrees upright along the sight line 
and the other one's set at the correct angle perpendicular to the sight line, we can line those up to reference marks on the centre of the drill. It really is a surprisingly accurate method. Next we'll taper the holes and that's to fit the tapered tenons on the legs. I actually made a video a few years ago on how to make a tapered reamer similar to this one. Glenn has already prepared the legs for us on the lathe and I'll show how he goes about that after I've fitted this leg. And I'm getting help here from Glenn's son, Tom. We're fitting down to a mark on the tenon. We're doing that like the rest of the project with accuracy. And it's surprising how quickly that happens at the end. You really do need to sneak up on it. Here's a few clips I got of Glenn showing us how he turns the legs on the lathe. And I'm trying to, as much as I can, to continuously move downhill. And you can see I can almost achieve a skew-like cut. See the shavings that are coming off that? And I'm already starting to create the six degrees. Now a good quality lay, gas bed lay, like this one is, the centre of the gap of the lay is the dead centre of the axis of the turning. Okay? So it stands to reason to create this tenon, there's no better opportunity to create a tenon that's perfectly in line with the axis of the leg than on a lathe. Mm. Yeah? A tenon cutter, yeah, like a pencil sharpener will sharpen that yeah. point, but you might be turning it two degrees off the, the axis of the, of the leg, yeah. unintentionally of course, but this, if you can if you can master that technique of what I'm just about to show you, it's just gold. Got to be. So I'll get a little bit closer there like that, and I'm not even looking at the block now, I'm just sort of bit of muscle memory. So now at least the block's on, right? I can check to see here if there's any shadow line in there and there's a slight one there and there's a slight one there. Yeah, yep, yep. So I want to bias my cutting sort of in here in a middle. little bit. Yep. yep. So that's the legs done. Here's mine fitting nicely into the seat. And um, by the way, the legs are maple and the seat is English elm. Next we'll mark and drill a mortise for a stretcher across the back legs. There's two rubber bands around the grooves in the legs which is where the centre of the stretcher will be. And by pulling a piece of string held by the two bands, when they snap back the string will be in the centre of the two legs. Now we're using this cool little jig which is like a dummy leg with a guide on it. It's set to the correct height and checked with a height gauge. I'll write down the length of the stretcher onto the back of the seat, then put the stretcher along with the legs aside and begin carving the seat. I started by drilling a couple of holes at the deepest point to use as depth guides. I think this is my favourite part of the project, I always enjoy some carving and even though I do own a scorp I've never actually used it before. It took a bit of getting used to but I did enjoy using a new tool. When I removed the bulk of the material I moved on to another tool that I've never used before. It's a travisher, I really liked it and I may make one in the future. Here's a different travisher, which is a fantastic tool to use. I'm using it here to refine things further. Next we cut the seat out on the bandsaw so I can start working on the edges. We leave the back corners on for now as they're handy to clamp the seat down and we'll do that section later on. Oh, 
Oh, yeah, it's a sneak up here. What's up? Mm -hmm. I don't know, somebody wants to squid. Uh, also, uh, having tried to it's a stunning piece of elm, but it's not the easiest thing to carve. But I keep chipping away at it. I'm really enjoying the process and working in such a fabulous setting along with great company. It doesn't actually get much better. Matt and Daryl have different wood for their seats. I can't remember what it was though. And I should have also mentioned that Simo isn't making a rocking chair. Instead, he's making a different style Windsor chair. If I remember correctly, it's called a democratic chair designed by Curtis Buchanan. That's the top fairly well done, so next I'll work on the underside. If I remember, this is day three, and we're trying to get our seats done and the legs glued in by the end of the day. The end grain on the elm is particularly tough, but as Glenn keeps reminding us, skew and slice makes everything nice. After making a sort of big chamfer, I'll mark either side of the high point and carve that down and eventually blend it in with a spoke shave. We're not using any sandpaper at all to finish it, so to smooth it out I'll use a card scraper and I reckon making shavings is far more fun than making dust. I'm ready to fit the leg, so we'll cut a curve in the leg tenon and make some wedges. Daryl was super quick and he was the first one to finish out every step. He's like a machine. We're using hot hide glue, which I've never used before. I really like it, so I'll definitely be getting hold of some for my own projects. You can hear it, yeah. We all got our legs glued in by the end of the day. The next day we're making the rockers and fitting them to the legs. Glenn already cut the slots in the leg for us and here's a very interesting jig that he uses with a router to do it. Come up, slide it across, push it through again and slide it across and we're done. Lift that up, pull it out, put it onto the second one. Down halfway, push it through. Down all the way, push it through. We're just shaping the end of the legs with the block plane, then we'll make the rockers. I've been eyeing up this incredible bandsaw all week and now we get to see it in use. We're shaping them down to the perfect thickness for a nice fit into the leg slots. We then shape the section flat where they fit into the bottom of the slot so they're fully seated. We do some final shaping and then we put the rockers aside. Yeah. 
Our arm rests are out of the heat cupboard and need a wider section on the end so a piece gets jointed and glued on. The spindles are also dry so we'll spend the rest of the day working on those and get them down to the final size and shape. There's a fair amount of work in the spindles so we spent a lot of time on the horses over the week. It was heaps of fun though making piles of shavings. It's day five and here I'm drilling holes in the armrests. They're for the posts that need fitting. I'm using lasers again as guides and next those holes will get tapered. Here's Daryl fitting his. Now the armrest is fitted, we'll mark and drill holes for the spindles to pass through and into the seat. We're using this clever jig where we can locate the hole positions on the seat that we've marked out from a template and the drill gets located onto the marks that we just made then the jig keeps everything in line. For the holes in the seat, we keep those in line by sighting across on the back of the drill through the holes that we just drilled in the armrest. Thank you, Neil, for keeping some level of decorum. Now we're reaming the holes on the underside of the armrest. We're using a mirror set just right to see the end of the reamer which can quite easily be kept centered in the hole by eye. It's day six and I made an early start working on my spindles. I'm carrying on rounding them and getting them a bit thinner as they still look a bit chunky. One of the things I really like about this chair is how elegant the spindles look. It's been a long road, but I Here I'm sizing the end of the spindle that goes into the seat and these are done really quite precisely. You ready? Yeah. I think Matt is really enjoying himself. That's my spindles fitted, next I'll try and fit the armrest. I did have to do this a few times after taking off a bit here and there on the odd spindle until it went down to the correct height. Now it's time for the back crest and everything is starting to come together. We did a bit of shaping then drilled a hole for the centre spindle which at the moment is the only one that we've cut to the correct length. That one needs fitting first so the others can be referenced off it. I've clamped the spindles in position then I mark them onto the back crest and even though I haven't shown it I've marked the bottom edge of the back crest onto each spindle. I've measured up so far from the height mark on the spindle and that's to the depth that I'll be drilling the holes in the back crest that will accommodate them and then I cut the spindles down. The ends all need sizing then I'll drill the rest of the holes in the back crest to do that, this time we're using two mirrors. It's pretty much the same setup as the lasers. One to keep the drill upright in one direction and the other to keep it at the correct angle in the other. You just need to keep your head still. I think I prefer this method. It works very well. You can clearly see the depth marker on the drill bit where with the laser, you're just looking on the top of the actual cordless drill. There's some final details to do on the arm and the back crest and then it's ready to glue together.
This is the only time we're using sandpaper and it's just to make sure that the spindles aren't too tight when we glue them in. We're only easing them and the joint isn't sloppy in any way whatsoever. There's a lot more details than I've shown in this video to making your Windsor chair, but hopefully it gives you an idea. If you ever want to go on a course yourself, then I can tell you Glenn is a wonderful teacher and just a great guy to hang out with for a while. When you feel the bottom out, you're done. Okay. Good. Okay. And there it is, it's all done. It does still need finish and I'll probably paint it with milk paint. It'd be interesting to hear what you think of that in the comments. I reckon it looks stunning from every angle. We've had the chair at home now for a couple of weeks or so and the family loves it, so it's a big hit. Thanks to Glenn for a fabulous week and letting me film in his workshop. I also nearly forgot to thank Lisa, Glenn's wife, for looking after us and baking something special for us each day. A big thanks to Matt, Darrell and Simo for putting up with me for a week. I also need to mention we're away for Christmas so there won't be another video for a while but I'll get straight back into it as soon as I'm home. Merry Christmas to all of you. Thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next one.